What is artificial intelligence? Artificial intelligence is creating powerful programs and softwares that have the ability to learn. So AI is really just some kind of algorithm that's pulling information from somewhere and compiling it together to create new things. Recognize patterns or understand our natural language, make predictions. AI is the ability for a machine to learn and do tasks like a human. like seeing, hearing, making decisions, and understanding languages. It can adapt and learn from its environment on its own, as opposed to having to go in to reprogram every single time. We are already seeing it in many aspects of our lives. Siri, Alexa, IBM Watson, self-driving cars, but we don't always think of those things as AI. Pull information from the internet to, to create the best answer possible, or it's looking at trends. We have our automated robots that might vacuum the house or mow the lawn. How can artificial intelligence help teachers? AI can help teachers in lots of different ways. Using it to create lesson plans, using it to create feedback for students, uh, really is a time saver right now. Give them opportunities to work more deeply on their strengths. Creative descriptions for presentations or uh, titles for presentations. Very new and can be very scary, but it also has a lot of great potential. Artificial intelligence has the power to free up teachers' time to focus more on teaching and student engagement. I've used it to come up with song lyrics and poems and all sorts of stuff. I also think of programs like Photomath or Wolfram Alpha, really powerful online calculators that have the ability to answer questions for students quickly and easily. Lessons that need to be prepared or written out if teachers embrace artificial intelligence, it's gonna give them the one thing that we ask for so much, which is time. I think AI has the potential to revolutionize education. But I also think about the power of programs to create um, AI-driven images and AI-driven writing and AI-driven anything. Automating grading and assessments tasks. It's going to automate tasks that teachers generally take a large amount of time to do. Providing personalized learning experiences. When I think about the power of AI changing education, I think a lot about a new baseline. Even something like ChatGPT with creating student work samples or student essays. Now that is the beginning of where I can begin that conversation. I know that my students should always be able to do something better than what the AI is going to produce. It's not just solving for the right answer in math class anymore, interpreting things, analyzing things, really some higher order thinking. And helping teachers develop and refine curriculum materials. It's going to give teachers back time that they need to spend with students and create those relationships. However, there's still always going to be that human element to it. I think that it's important to remember our students are never going to live in a world where AI is weaker than it is right now. I think when we start to really embrace artificial intelligence, it's going to make us think about what we are teaching and really be purposeful about the process that we're teaching and what outcomes that we want. I think that teachers just need to see the positive potential of AI as opposed to the negative things which I think a lot of people are focusing on right now. Welcome all, you're listening to the MLTI 2.0 podcast, Teaching with Tech. We are your hosts, MLTI Ambassadors. We are here to support Maine educators by building a network focused on authentic voices, experiences, and technology integration. Welcome back everybody to another episode of Teaching with Tech. As you may have guessed from that introduction today, 
we're going to be discussing artificial intelligence and its future in the classroom. I am your host, Rob Dominic, and I am joined by fellow ambassadors Kate Meyer and Nicole Kerod, both of whom have dug into AI since its more public emergence this last fall, and they will be able to share their knowledge and experience with it thus far. If you are interested further into what they've experienced so far, please check out their video on our MLTI YouTube channel titled AI From Fear to Inspiration. Our episode today will consist of a discussion with a goal of giving you background information about AI. We hope to catch you up to speed about what is out there, get some insight from Kate and Nicole through their experimentation with it, and then lastly, leave you thinking about a plan of action on how you can implement AI into your own classroom. So first of all, I think one of the biggest questions here that comes around with technology, any technology that comes out uh, to the everyday educator is why should we have interest in AI overall? Uh, a lot of times with new technology, there's a little bit of trepidation that's associated with it. And people feel like they, they don't really want to dig into it or they're just thinking it's going to be another fad and it's going to fade away after it hits this, this initial boom. Um, so really, I guess, why? Why should we be caring about this AI that has emerged this year? Okay, I'll have you go first. I think the reason that I'm really diving into AI and encouraging educators to dive into AI is because this is this technology is not going away. We are seeing it being embraced by the business world, by the tech world, and and by educators. Um, and this isn't this is a type of technology that is going to continue to grow all around us. So I think this is a piece of tech that we should be invested in, that we should start exploring, because it is going to become part of our daily routines, um, probably in the very near future. Yeah, and to agree with Kate, that if because it's going to be our future, we're really doing a disservice to our students if we're not teaching it. It's going to be their future jobs. It's going to be embedded in everything they do. And then as a teacher point of view, I kind of think, well, why wouldn't I use it if it's going to save me time and be helpful? It's not only going to be the classroom, as you said, it's going to be embedded in our everyday society as we go along. So you know, we need to bring that into the classroom as much as possible to help the kids see it. You know, we we just got one of those uh, Roomba type robots to, to vacuum and it's consent toys or dog messes around the house. Um, and it's been fantastic. So uh I don't think we'll be able to go back at this point. So absolutely, it's going to be everywhere around us. I guess the next question then is, if an educator does decide to pursue some interest in AI, um, you know, they're going to to dig into it, they're going to dive into it, but they may not know where to start because they're overwhelmed by technology or it's just too new and there's so much information and they just have this overload phase in their brain. What would you have for some recommendations or advice to start digging into AI and, and understanding what's out there. I started exploring chat GPT pretty shortly after it was released. And the way that I started was trying to figure out how I could use it as my personal assistant, um, you know, the educators don't get. Um, and so how can I leverage um, chat GPT to improve my workflow? So I was, you know, just testing it to see, can it write course descriptions for me? Can I have a conversation with it about unit planning? And can it give me ideas? Can I use it like a thought partner um, to create a, a new class? So I I started playing with it that way. Um, I interacted with it just like it was someone sitting across from me at a table um, and tried to view it that way as I kind of entered into that exploration. Um, and that really helped me see some of the possibilities that I probably wouldn't have discovered otherwise for a little while. I also got a couple of books. Um, so there were a couple of books published over the winter. Um, one of them is AI for Educators by Matt Miller. And Matt Miller is the author of Ditch That textbook. He's very popular. Um, and another t book called The AI Classroom, The Ultimate Guide to Artificial Intelligence in Education by Daniel Fitzpatrick, Amanda Fox, and Brad Weinstein. And those two books are just 
incredible collections of resources for educators to start thinking about how to leverage AI in the classroom. So I, I read those, gave me more ideas, and I just have gone on from there. Yeah, you definitely need to have those books in your library. Uh, they're excellent and just a lot of resources. As an entry point, I think I would start with Canva. It's a tool that a lot of teachers are already familiar with. Um, it's free for educators. So if you're not already using Canva, check it out just for the cool factor of Canva. But then it, it just incorporated, I think, 10 new AI tools. And it has anything from Magic Right, which is very similar to Chat GT. GPT, as well as you can take um, and put information in a document and then say, here, make a presentation out of it. And it will turn it into a presentation and talk about saving you time um, if you're making a slide deck or something along those lines. It will help produce pictures so you can go um, from text to image. So if you need to have a certain image, you can pop that in there and out produces the image that you want. So there's a lot of really cool tools in Canva and it's just a nice entry point for someone trying it out. Excellent. I really like those pieces of advice there. Um, playing around with things is always a great way to understand technology, as Kate mentioned, plus the simple reading books, right? You're, you're taking the analog approach to that digital learning, which I think can help a lot of educators who, who might be looking just to get their toes wet with this uh, integration. And then another great point, Nicole, with, with Canva, right? You're taking a familiar tool and you're seeing how it's being uh, enhanced with this AI and then Hopefully that'll get people more experience and more comfort with what AI can do because you're totally right. It can it can really enhance very easily these little tasks along the way. You're just like, wow, that was so much more simple, you know, because it has these AI integration. And I would say that you're going to see that in a lot of the tools that you're looking at. So always check out, like, is there an AI feature and how can I play with that? Yes, there are a lot of. Uh, websites and programs out there that I'm finding are in incorporating uh, more AI as they go along. And it's it's pretty fun, honestly, to see how they're finding it to, to integrate it best and how it makes things easier, really. Ultimately, that's what it should be doing. It should be making things a lot easier for people. As, as great as this may be and all the possibilities that it holds with uh, artificial intelligence integration, uh, and what you've seen so far and what you've looked at or read what are the biggest challenges that you envision educators will face in the emergence of AI in schools as it goes forward? And then conversely, though, are, are there any benefits that you think will most likely outweigh those challenges as it becomes more familiar? So I'm going to look at this with a little bit of a different perspective and think about um, sometimes our attitudes towards technology is that we have to block it and like, I'm not going to let this happen in my classroom. And I think, you know, some of the pieces that probably Kate will talk about with, you know, plagiarism and cheating and things like that, um, because of that, we tend to say like it's not happening in my classroom and I'm just going to revert back. Every kid is just going to hand write an essay. And that really worries me for those students that are struggling learners, because then we're not just assessing what they know. It's really like, can you write? Can, do you have the motor skills to do that? Um, it, and it becomes a whole a whole other problem. And so that is my worry. I hope that we're teaching how to use it, how to cite it, how to critically think about it so that it can have the best benefits. Yeah, and I've been talking with educators about their concerns around AI and the theme that just kind of constantly keeps bubbling up and seems to be sh shutting some educators down is just that idea of ethical use around AI in the classroom, um, both for students and for themselves. And I really think that it's going to push us to rethink what plagiarism and cheating are. Um, Matt Miller from Ditch That Textbook has a really great graphic on his website um, that's called It's Time to Rethink Plagiarism and Cheating. And it's a continuum for us to think about that goes all the way from completely student-created work to completely bot-created work and everything in between. And so at what point um, do we consider using AI 
cheating? Is it when a student creates multiple AI responses and then uses the best ones and edits them and puts that into their own work? Is that cheating or is that collaboration? What about um, having the bot completely um, write everything and copy and paste that into a Google Doc? Um, and, and so all the way around that continuum, and I think it's a great conversation for us to have. And I, I really do think as technology advances in this way, that we really do have to rethink what that means um, around students using those tools. And the same thing for educators. If I have a tool, um, an AI tool, you create my lesson plans, is that, am I plagiarizing? If I have it right, mentor texts, are those plagiarized texts? Um, or is it a collaboration um, between the educator and the machine? So I think that there's a lot to think about and wrestle with and have conversations around. And I don't think there's a right answer um, right now. Uh, but I think that that's something that we could very easily let, a, you know, we could very easily let that drive us to exactly what Nicole said, which was just blocking it and pretending like it doesn't exist. So one thing that as we're talking and we're thinking about this one lesson that I heard that could kind of really show you what it could do, not only with you, but also your students, is I heard about an educator that had four, three or four groups, and they had, um, they all had the same topic that they had to write about. And one group was only allowed to use chat GPT. They were not allowed to use anything else. And then there was another group that could collaborate with chat GPT, but they couldn't use all of it. Like they had, it had to be a collaboration. And then there was another group that was no chat GPT. And then afterwards they compared all the writing and looked at, you know, what's going on here. And this educator had said that a lot of the kids were like, obviously you can't just use chat GPT. And so what a cool outcome for everybody to realize that it's a tool. That's, that's really what we have is a tool. And now we have to teach students how to use it. I think that's an excellent point uh, between the two of you there about it. That is right. It is, it's an extra tool that has to be have a, a conversation around it about how best to integrate that tool, right? And I, I agree that trying to shun it completely just is, is not going to solve any problems, really. I think it's going to create even more. In my mind, I equate it, you know, with a math background, I equate it to all the technology that's been, been able to solve math problems for, you know, almost a decade now, you know? Um, that's been in the math world for quite a while, where kids can scan their work and, just get the answer and even maybe even get a step-by-step -step piece. Um, and that's not going to go away. However, it should be part of the conversation. It's not like we're banning math problems now because of that, you know, and it, it just changes the conversation to what types of questions are we asking? And then also, you know, what, what about that answer? Can they do with that information? You know, the analytical part, you know, about that answer. What, what does that tell you about the problem or what decisions are you going to make based on that answer that you got in that word problem? We're going to cut in just to give you a quick break and remind you that this podcast, Teaching with Tech, is being produced by the MLTI 2.0 team at the Maine Department of Education. Should you need to contact us with comments or maybe even your own insight into a topic, please feel free to email us at doe-mlti2.0 at main.gov. Now we will return back to the conversation with Kate and Nicole, where you will be able to hear about their recommendations for effective ways of integrating AI and also what they would be doing themselves should they have to step back in the classroom starting tomorrow. So as we're looking forward here um, with AI and how it's emerged, I kind of feel like this might be one of those moments as we look back to the fall of 2022 when ChatGPT, OpenAI really first went public with everything, that it may end up being like as monumental as the tech boom that we saw in 2004 to 2006 with, with iPhone and social media um, and how that started to explode. So even though we're still, you know, in the infancy of, of AI here, as human nature goes, people have been studying it, they've been playing around with it, they want to learn about it, you've done it yourself, there's been others who have who've made books already about it, 
from what you've seen, what are the most effective ways to get the most out of AI resources that have emerged so far? So I think we've said it a couple of times is just a reminder that it's a collaboration between uh, the machine and you. So let's say that you do ask it to do something and it's not what you want it to be. Ask it to change it up. Uh, I think one of the first times I had asked it to write an email to a parent and it was extremely formal. And I was like, oh, that doesn't sound like me. So I literally just said, could you please rewrite this a little less formal? And I was like, oh, that's it. And so remember that it's it's a back and forth. It's as if someone's sitting there with you and you're you're going back and forth with them and collaborating with them to create a product. I completely agree with Nicole about that collaboration piece. And the where I kind of started playing with that was when ChatGPT first came out, the idea of prompt engineering. So really learning how to communicate with it to get that best collaboration, like Nicole said. So you're not getting these incredibly formal parent, you know, emails to parents that you would never send out. But how do you get it to create something that that sounds like you? How do you collaborate with it? And so I spent a couple of months um, just researching and, and playing with different prompt um, engineering ideas that I was finding online as everybody else was trying to figure out the same thing. Um, and again, I will go back to a resource that I mentioned earlier, the AI Classroom um, book, because that book, at, when it came out, then really dug into um, prompt engineering specifically for educators. Um, and the, the authors of that text came up with an acronym to help us um, create the best prompts to get that best collaboration. And so the acronym that they use is PREP. Um, and I won't dive too deep into that, but it's around, you know, telling the machine, you know, what its role is and what you want out of it and and how you want the output to come to you, you know, in what format. Um, and so then playing or again, like back to that idea of play, just playing around with the prompt engineering and using that acronym to keep me focused and to help me get the most out of um, my communication with the machine. So. I think that that's a really important piece. And then, you know, Nicole mentioned Canva. And so now there's text to image and text to video and, and all of these things. And so once you have that prompting kind of um, internalized, that transfers to all the different platforms. So it's it's not just specific to chat GPT, but it will work with all these other platforms that are emerging in education. And something that Kate reminds me of often is um, don't forget you can mash up your sites that you use. So if you need a prompt for, for you know, a art site, you know, generating images, ask G GPT to create that image for you or create that prompt to get that image. And so mash those up and use them together. Nice. <clears throat> Thank you for that. I, I do think it's important people know that Right, you're you're still only as good as the user that that works with the uh, computer program, the AI interaction. Right, you you need to have that user piece of it as effective as possible. All right, so you've been in this ambassador role, Nicole, for this last year. Kate, you've been here for a couple of years. You are going back to the classroom next year. Um, Nicole, you might be thinking ahead to what's happening after this ambassador program for you. If you were going back. In the classroom, put yourself in the shoes of, of those who might be listening. If you're going back to the classroom tomorrow, what's the first thing that you're looking to do with AI to help yourself out? Well, I am headed back to my English classroom in the fall. Um, so right now I am really collaborating with ChatGPT around um, writing writing full course descriptions, um, creating unit plans, all the way down to writing specific unit plans, or sorry, specific lesson plans. And, and even as granular as I am now having it create stations for me and recommend materials to use um, with my students. So I can give it a theme and ask it for videos and books and articles and short stories like what do you recommend chat gpt and it's giving me the materials that is saving me a summer of research just to find the materials and then i have to read them and figure out how to use them um so i am already well <laughs> into my journey um with chat gpt in terms of my return to the fall my first thought with this response was literally like what do you mean return to the classroom i'm using it right now um so i think just continue using it for everything. Like if you have to write an email and it's tough, like 
check with GPT. If you have to write a recommendation, check with GPT, like use it in your everyday to save time. And then I think a, another perspective of this is to start to really think about what am I teaching? And is it just about the product that kids are producing or is it about the process? And so when students are going to use AI or now when they are using AI, because many of them are, I want to make sure that what I'm teaching them is really purposeful and meaningful for their future versus just, I need them to pump up, pump out a product that, you know, they could just plug into GPT and it does it on its own. Well, I would have to say, um, from my own perspective as well, going back to the classroom next year, um, what I've liked the most out of it too, and that I would do in in my classroom is I love that it's it's basically a an idea generator for me as well, and the kind of that's what Kate was mentioning about writing courses or coming up with ideas and lessons. Um, you know, I love to be able to dig into an idea and run with it when the time comes. But for whatever reason, that that initial creativity piece of writing the email or coming up with those those uh, brainstorming pieces. I'm like, eh, you know, I'm not a, not as big into that. But once I'm able to really find something and dig into it, I feel great with it. So um, I definitely see that that's, that's going to be the best part for me is using it to generate those ideas that I can then sift through and get going on. So as we wrap up this conversation um, and all your points that you made, what's one last piece of advice that you would give to help quell the fears of this AI revolution so people aren't so worried about it and feel more comfortable digging into it? I think, you know, I would say approach it with a sense of play. Um, embrace the ambiguity of it. None of us are experts in AI at this point. It is new. It is emerging. It is growing in real time all around every single one of us. So, you know, just embrace that and explore it with curiosity. To add on to Kate's, I would say it's OK to go slow. Um, you don't have to know it all at once. And then the second part of that is use it. I think once you once you see what it's capable of and you see how much time it will save you, it it will be a no brainer. You'll you'll say, I have to use this. And so to think about that, like I, I'm going to really challenge you is after you get done listening to this to go to the links in the description, we're going to put um, some links to to use AI. And I really like you to click on those and and dive into it and say what can i find out what what tips can i use from today's episode and um create and save some time for myself in the classroom um because as teachers you deserve that time and so hopefully this will be a way to give it back to you what a fantastic idea time for teachers for educators how glorious that would be right well, I thank you both for your insight and your knowledge thus far of what you've been able to see from artificial intelligence in the classroom. And I hope, again, it piqued others' interest listening to this episode about what's possible with AI and maybe, maybe helped quell some fears that you might have um, and made you more comfortable with trying to dig into it. Well, that's it for this episode about the hot topic of AI in the classroom. We hope you join us next time when we go deeper to AI in the classroom and talk a lot about the debate between using AI and if it's plagiarism or cheating, and then also the best prompting tools and the best prompting practices to get the most out of AI. Personally, I was using AI the other day to write about the history of my life. It really brings a new meaning to autobiography. Class dismissed. <laughs>